Well, uh, thank you for this introduction. And so, so you've heard uh, who I am and what I do for a living. What you don't know yet is that I spent 10 years of my life writing a big book on a Greek tragedy called Rhesus, of which we know neither the author nor the date, except that it was probably composed in the first half of the fourth century BC. Now, if you ask yourselves, uh, why did she do this and shouldn't she get out more? I, <laughs> I hope that in the next 10 to 15 minutes, I will be able to provide an answer to at least the first question. Essentially, it's very simple. There is a story which has all the ingredients of a Hollywood blockbuster. Wartime espionage and detention, horse theft, mass murder, and even perhaps a sort of werewolf. Only romance, I'm afraid, is somewhat lacking. In fact, I would like to see the screenwriter who would dare to put all this into a single script. My anonymous playwright did not, of course, make up his plot from scratch. A few tragedians ever did. He took, uh, Greek tragedians, that is. He took over the basic storyline from Homer's Iliad, book 10 to be precise, and varied it with elements found in other versions of the tale and probably quite a lot that sprang from his own imagination. The play was so popular that it inspired vast painters and some later authors and eventually made its way into the ancient school curriculum. But already in the early 5th century BC, Greek artists regularly illustrated scenes from Ilya 10 and or its variants. One fragment of such a painted vessel is kept in the Ashmolean, and I will discuss it in a moment. First, however, after I laid out so many baits, what is this hair-raising story? The Iliad, as you may know, covers only a few days in the 10th and final year of the Trojan War, and Book 10 describes the events of a single night. The Greeks have just had a very bad day. They were pressed hard by the Trojans, who enjoy the temporary support of Zeus, and confident that on the following day they will defeat the Greeks for good, they have pitched camp on the battlefield instead of returning to Troy. This worries Agamemnon and the other Greek leaders so much that they decide to dispatch a spy to see what the Trojans are planning. Diomedes, one of their great warriors, uh, volunteers and departs together with Odysseus, the man of many resources. The pair of them are always good for undercover missions in early Greek epic. Now for reasons that are not quite clear from the narrative, the Trojans come up with the same idea. Their volunteer spy is Dolon, a despicably unheroic figure, whose name means trickster in Greek, and who has the temerity to ask for Achilles' immortal horses as a reward. He goes off into the dark, dressed in a skull cap and a wolf skin. That is where the potential werewolf comes in. Uh, more on that later on. The two parties meet in no man's land, and Dolon is captured by Odysseus and Diomedes. He tries to buy his life with the promise of a princely ransom. His father is very wealthy, and he the only son among five daughters and some exciting news. In just that night, a powerful new ally has arrived for the Trojans. It's the Thracian king Rhesus, who rode in, clad in gold-plated armor, a, on a gold and silver-studded chariot drawn by a pair of snow-white horses, almost like a god, a wonder to behold. Shouldn't the two Greeks rather go after him? They agree, and what began as a military reconnaissance expedition turns into a gory night raid. Dolon is their first victim, so all his pleading was for nothing. And after they've reached the Thracian camp, Diomedes kills 13 Thracians in his sleep, including Rhesus, while Odysseus is leading away the precious white horses. The chariot would have been impractical to take. They return to their own camp just before dawn and recover over a bath and a hearty meal. This sounds all pretty grim and not at all heroic in the modern sense. But it is important to add that in everything they did that night, Odysseus and Diomedes had the support of their patron goddess Athena. In two early variants of the tale, which we only know from second-hand sources, 
Athena even prompts them to go out and kill Rhesus, who is presented as a serious threat to the Greeks should he survive the night. Uh, this is one of the external elements the playwright of Rhesus took over. So all is fair in love and war? Not quite, uh, uh, as far as the Iliad is concerned. And the discrepancy between the underhand dealings in Book 10 and the heroic standards applied in the rest of the poem is one of the many reasons why, ever since antiquity, this episode has been suspected of being a spurious addition. But such scholarly questions did not interest the ancient Greek poets and visual artists who, unsurprisingly, found in this story much to stimulate them. A splendid South Italian funerary vase of the mid 4th century BC, uh, now in the Antiken Sammlung in Berlin, shows the massacre in the Thracian camp. There are several, uh, that doesn't work, several dead Thracians lying around. Um, Odysseus has already taken hold of the white horses, while Diomedes is looming over the sleeping Rhesus at the top. Um, and Rhesus is distinguished from the other Thracians by his elaborate dress and bedding, and for anyone who didn't get it that way, by an inscription that gives his name, Rhesus, very small at the top. To the right of Rhesus and Diomedes, we have Athena, which clearly indicates her endorsement of the action. The male and female figures uh, on the very right are probably Rhesus' parents, a Thracian river god and a muse. Uh, they occur in the play Rhesus, but not in Ilya 10. So the later poet did manage to include uh, something of a tragic love story, and the vast painter was evidently taken by this. Note also the homely detail of the campfire in the middle. Incidentally, this vessel is enormous, standing almost a meter tall, well, yeah, about that high. There are a few uh, similar illustrations, but far more often, vast painters of all periods have turned to Dolan's fate, perhaps simply because it was easier to draw and to arrange on a variety of vessels than the mass scene in the Thracian camp. One such vessel, as I said, is here in the Ashmolean, though not at present on public display. It is a fragment of an Attic Oinokoe, uh, or wine jug, of the early 5th century BC. In so-called black figure painting, we see Dolon in the middle being um, intercepted by Diomedes on the left and Odysseus on the right. Dolon and Odysseus are again named in somewhat crude lettering. Uh, there's sort of these uh, blobs uh, or dots. And Diomedes is further identified by the sword he seems to be about to run into Dolon's stomach. In Ilya 10 and later sources, it is usually he who does all the killing. The funny uh, teapot shaped hats uh, Odysseus and Diomedes are wearing are uh, petasoi, or traveling hats. They indicate that Odysseus and Diomedes are out and about, but otherwise are quite incongruous with, with the written source, as well as the general situation. In Ilya 10, the Greeks each wear an unusual type of helmet, which would not shine in the dark. Why put on a floppy felt hat instead, except for iconographic reasons? Uh, more interesting, perhaps, are the animal skins around the shoulders of Dolon and Diomedes. In the case of Diomedes, it is probably a lion skin, which is not in Ilya 10, but here additionally marks him out as a mighty warrior. Dolon clearly wears a wolf skin, as in the epic. Now, wolves had a bad reputation in ancient Greece, just like in medieval folklore and sometimes still today. They were feared as predators, but did not have the uh, sort of quasi-royal status of lions. Sneaky they were, ignoble tricksters. So it's no wonder that Dolon, who bears trickery in his name and stealthily creeps around at night, uh, is characterized by this animal. But there may be more to this. In the play Rhesus, Dolon does not simply put the wolf skin around his shoulders, but describes quite elaborately how he plans to disguise himself fully as a wolf, to the point of going on all fours. 
This is not the fantasy of a semi-degenerate uh, tragedian of the fourth century, as has often been thought, because a group of early fifth century Attic vase paintings shows Dolon in precisely this attire. One very fragmentary cup now kept in Paris depicts the same scene as our Ashmolean wine jug. Dolon is held captive by Odysseus and Diomedes, uh, but the lower part of his body uh, here looks considerably more wolfish. The female figure on the far right is Athena, while on the far left, Hermes, the patron god of heralds, thieves, and undercover agents, uh, is leaving Dolon to his fate. But my personal favorite is the Louvre Lekythos, or oil flask, where Dolon appears on his own, covered in the wolf skin and crawling on all fours. From these images and the description in the recess play, some scholars have deduced the existence of an early variant to Ilya 10, in which Dolon pretends to be a wolf. And the most daring of these scholars believe that this may go back to a very ancient werewolf tale. The idea is not as far-fetched as it sounds, because much in Greek epic has its roots in time immemorial. Odysseus, one of our Greek protagonists, and the hero best known for his cunning, has a maternal grandfather called Autolikos, which translates as himself a wolf. It could all, of course, have been a lot more boring. Dolon, who has no life in other Greek myth and bears a suspiciously opposite name, could simply have been invented at some point as a base counterpart to Odysseus and Diomedes, and subsequent poets and or vast painters elaborated on his role. We will never be able to know for certain, as unfortunately is so often the case in our field. Nevertheless, I hope that my epic tour de force has been both informative and reasonably entertaining. It's a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to work with such texts and artifacts, and I'm glad that I had the opportunity to share something of that with you tonight. If you think that I could have slipped in more James Bond references to do justice to my title, I shall conclude with the observation that while the ancient Greeks did not have a 007, they had Odysseus and Diomedes with a license to kill on Agamemnon's secret service. Thank you. Thank you.